We've got some refreshments, you know, some cake. We're going to take a few pictures. There's some stuff that you can uh, uh, sit at, some tables you can sit at. Uh, also, some, just some refreshments. If you'd like, uh, we're not insisting that you do. The more you eat, the less goes into our freezer and less I will eat in later days. And so, uh, please stay and get some. Uh, if, you need to, if, you, if you don't want to spoil your, your lunch, your dinner, uh, then take a little bit with you uh, would be fine. Those of you on Facebook, you just missed it, so sorry about that, but uh, anyway, uh, thank you. We will be receiving communion. Thank you, babe. Yes, you're dismissed. We'll be receiving communion uh, uh, just a little bit after the message, and so um, let's go ahead and pray over our offering. Uh, those of you who, you know, uh, you've many of you have already put your offerings in the receptacle in the back. If you haven't, you can do that as you walk out. Uh, Aaron, uh, those of you watching by Facebook or YouTube will see that there is a QR code. Uh, we're, we're moving up in technology. Uh, for you who don't know what a QR code is, don't worry about it. Um, it it's uh, something you can uh, use your cell phone and it'll take you right to a portal to our website and you can give if you'd like to do that online. Amen. Uh, so Father, we thank you. Just say this with me. This is my investment in the kingdom of heaven so that Living Glory Church can fulfill its divine ministry. Your word says that when we sow a seed, we can expect a harvest. My harvest is coming in, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I'll never have a bill I can't pay. I'll never have a need that, I can't, that you won't meet according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The mortgage on Living Glory Church and all of our bills are paid in full. Amen. Miss McKenzie, would you do the announcements, please? call your couple of attentions to the announcements. This afternoon, um, I just got word uh, earlier this week, um, our Kingdom Huddle, which is a uh, group of about 65 pastors who meet on a once, once a month, and uh, we meet and have uh, prayer, we meet for lunch, we meet and uh, get some instruction. Um, we are having, we're sponsoring a corporate prayer meeting this afternoon from 6 to 7 at one church, which is uh, the old uh, Hope Alive Church. Uh, they changed the name to One Church Acadiana. It's on uh, James Boudreau Road in Scott. Uh, and so uh, several of the pastors will be praying. If you're interested, uh, you can text me. I can give you more information. Uh, to that. I can tell you where it is. Uh, we're going to be there uh, from 6 to 7. It's corporate prayer. There will be, uh, like I said, three or four different pastors praying uh, for our community, for our city, for our state. And so if you'd like to be there, uh, please uh, join us as we pray. Amen. The other thing is that next weekend, um, how many of you have been with us long enough to know who Javed Albert is? 
He is a bishop in Pakistan and he will be with us. We have been supporting his ministry uh, in fact for 33 years. Uh, his ministry was the first uh, offering that we took at Living Glory Church. We sowed it into his ministry uh, almost 34 years ago. And so uh, he will be with us next weekend, uh, Saturday night and again on Sunday morning. So we'd love for you to be here and be part of that. Amen. If you'll notice on the back on the back table at the Welcome Center, I produced some welcome some invite cards. If you'd like to take three or four of them, just you know you have somebody you'd like to invite to church, pick one of these up, pick a couple of them up, and then invite them to church. You may have to pick them up and bring them to church, but that's okay. Do that, and we'll start filling this place up. Amen. Um, over the years. Um, Pastor B and I are celebrating 50 years. Uh, you pick a little something up. You learn a little bit of something about marriage and connecting and <laughs> relating to one another. Uh, even if it's just by chance and by accident, you pick something up. Uh, you know, we grew up with these fairy tale things that uh, you hear the word and they lived happily ever after. Um, Pastor B and I watch, and we've not, not as much right now, we watch these, uh, some of my macho friends call them chick flicks. You know, it's where guy meets girl and, and, and uh, there's adversity and then over the period of three or four days, they get to start thinking about each other and they start connecting with each other and then there's a blow up and then a make up and then there's a kiss at the end and you get the picture that they live happily ever after. I'd like to tell you that that's false advertisement <laughs> because they don't always and so I put together what I call the marriage beatitudes. <laughs> that if you have this attitude, if you be this attitude, then you can possibly have a happily ever after. Uh, and, and so, uh, and as I was meditating on it this morning, the Lord gave me four or five more that I don't have time to put in here. And, and so we're going to cover these and see where we go with that. Uh, you should have gotten an outline. If you didn't and you want one, we can produce some more if we've run out of them. Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the, sh and the two shall become one flesh. It's often passage used in a wedding ceremony. What we have to understand, first of all, is that I remember, you know, 20 years old, I thought about my uncle Moise, who never married and was just an old bachelor, and, and I thought, I'm going to wind up like Uncle Moe's. I'm 20. I, I, and I don't have a girlfriend, or I had one. Uh, Pastor B and I dated for two years, on and off, more off than on. Uh, you know, just being honest. And, and you know, so I thought, wh where am I going to find a, a wife? And, and so just, if I, ha if I just get married, I'll, I'll be happy. And, and sometimes people have that idea that if I can just get married, find the wife or find the husband, I'll be, I'll be happy. Um, and, and sometimes that is the case. And sometimes it's, if I can just be unmarried, <laughs> I'll be happy. What we have to realize is that no one person can fulfill and help complete us the way God can. No one person can be everything that we need. 
that will fulfill our needs for acceptance, fulfill our need for identity, our fulfill our need for security, and fulfill our need for purpose. And so uh, what we understand is we are two imperfect people coming together trying to make this thing work. Marriage is spelled W-O-R-K. Uh, it, it, it does not, you know, as people say, it was, your marriage was made in heaven. It might have been made in heaven, but it's worked out here on planet earth. Amen. And so I like uh, to use a particular verse of scripture when I do a wedding. It's called, it's from Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. It, it didn't make it in your outline. Uh, it basically says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, unfortunately, our culture tells us, do unto others and then run. Or, do unto others and don't get caught. Uh, but when we look at it from a marriage perspective, it's the golden rule. It's the process. It's the principle of sowing and reaping. If I expect my my wife to be my princess, I, I can't treat her like an old shoe. If you want your husband to be your, your knight in shining armor, you can't treat him as the frog in the pond. Uh, you, 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 so what you, what you sow, you also reap. Uh, Galatians chapter 6 tells us that. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he shall also reap. So the Beatitudes, the, the, either the marriage attitude, Beatitudes, or the happily ever after attitudes, whichever one you want is fine. The first one is that uh, if you're going to make this thing work, you have to be adaptable. You see, uh, we were raised and grew up in different families. Grew up, uh, Pastor B's family had uh, five siblings. I had one sibling. And so we were raised by completely different people. Mama's back there and uh, Pastor B's parents have passed and they're watching from the grandstands of heaven. And so we have to be adaptable, adjustable. Why? Because if you go into a relationship, now understand you can use this either for marriage or just friendships. If you are the, the rigid one and you don't make any adjustments, you're going to have a hard time getting along with folks. Because if, you, if it's got to be your way or the highway, then it's going to be difficult to, for people to uh, uh, want to be around you or be with you. And so uh, we have to be adjustable. Philippi uh, Philippians chapter 2 says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done from selfish ambition or conceit. In other words, it's got to be the way I want it. I have my opinion and it has to be my way. But in lowliness of mind, let each of you esteem others better than himself. Look, let each one of you look out not for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. There's a passage in Ephesians chapter 5 where it says, Wives, submit to your husband. For some men, that's the only verse of scripture they know. <laughs> And they're not afraid to use that scripture. What they don't realize is the next verse says, Submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. And so that word submit is a military term, which simply means there is a leader and there are some subordinates. There are some those that are underneath them. They are the array, arraignment, the arrangement of 
soldiers or naval people, military people. Uh, if you talk to Caleb and Ethan Luna, you'll find out they, exact, they know exactly what that military term means. They are in the Marines at Camp Lejeune. And so if you were in the military, you know what that term means. But from a non-military perspective, it simply means to have a voluntary attitude of cooperation. In other words, I voluntarily submit, I voluntarily choose to cooperate with another person, with another organization, with a team of people who are working in a committee. We volunteer, voluntarily commit for cooperation. So from a marriage perspective, we assume the responsibilities of carrying out our part and we voluntarily submit, voluntarily cooperate, uh, have an attitude of cooperation with the other party. Realizing that it is reciprocal. In other words, it's not just one way. It is back and forth. It is, uh, you know, sometimes we think marriage is a give and take situation. I don't like that. I believe it's a give and receive situation. In other words, if I've got to take something, I don't necessarily want to do it that way. I don't mind giving and then I'll gladly receive. Why? That makes it reciprocal. So what I give, then I'm going to then begin to receive. It's mutual. There's both sides are involved. It's not just one side or the other. It's voluntary. It's a matter of the will, a choice that we make when we get married. It's not by coercion. In other words, my father-in-law wasn't standing at the altar with a shotgun. <laughs> We were not coerced into 50 years ago getting married. And it's intimate. It's important. We have to be adaptable. Because before, before you know it, you'll find out that one person is a needy. They're uh, OCD. With having everything just right. The shelves are labeled and everything's got to go back in their shelves. Got to go back in that spot. And others are not as neat. <laughs> and, and consequently, they're always looking for stuff. They are organized. Nobody else can find what they have, but they know where it is. And so don't mess with their organizational system. And if you're the needy, and, and you, you, you just have to adjust because you have to give your messy some places where they can just be messy. <laughs> They just, just, that's just life. Now, if you're the messy, uh, realize that don't try to infringe on your needy's place. It's really difficult if you have to share one walk-in closet. It's really nice if you can have two closets, one for him and one for her. Uh, makes it real nice. Now, sometimes you have individuals who are prompt, who are on time, always ahead of time, and then you have others that are, they get there on time, but just by the skin of their teeth. And sometimes you have to give them some slack and realize that it's choose your battles of what you're going to try to change realizing you can't change your spouse if you've tried it gets frustrating you can't change the other person you can only change yourself now one of the things that be adaptable about is be willing to try some new things 
You know, Pastor B loves to do open houses. Go look at, uh, uh, go, go see open houses. N n not the houses that are left unlocked and people are still living there, uh, okay? Uh, it's when, when there are some open houses and the houses are for sale and people say, come see my house. Pastor B thinks that literally it's a personal invitation to go see their house. And so I had to adjust. You've seen one house, you've seen them all. And so I would go with her and we'd go walking through these houses and the parade of homes, yes, the parade of homes was a, was a staple of our activities on Sunday afternoon, usually in April and May. Uh, go check all these million dollar homes and dream and wish and think, I couldn't live here. This is not a livable house. Then there's the shopping that... Uh, for Pastor B, it is an emotional release to go shopping. I, I am more the hunter. I'm going conquest. I'm going to find what I need and go home. The shortest amount of time spent in the store, the better. But I've adjusted and I've enjoyed the uh, open houses. I've enjoyed the shopping. Why? Because I'm with her. A number of years ago, I took up the game of golf. Very humbling game. And to be real honest with you, I was not real good. Uh, and Pastor B, wanting to be with me, said, I think I'd like to take up golf. And I thought, oh my. <laughs> If, if, if you talk about athletically challenged, that is my lovely wife. But in order to be with me on Friday afternoons or Friday mornings, we, she took up the game of golf and for a number of years, uh, we would go out every Friday and sometimes we would dress after church on Sunday morning in the, the restrooms here and then we would grab a quick bite and go hit, go do uh, nine holes or 18 holes on a Sunday afternoon uh, until an event took place and she injured her neck and my golf partner was no longer my golf partner and so I haven't played golf since because I missed that opportunity to be with her out on the golf course and I didn't feel like I wanted to be away from her for those four hours. So sometimes we have to adjust and try some new things. It will not kill you. Number two, and I need to hurry because this, this could, you know, there's nine of them so they could take long. Um, the second one is be appreciative. Uh, Ephesians 1 16 says I cease not to give thanks for you you know sometimes we've got a uh, there are differences you know he, there are obvious physical differences but there are some differences in likes and differences in dislikes differences in personality differences of opinions but we get to uh, learn and appreciate the differences and appreciate the similarities. There are a lot of ways that Pastor B and I are similar. But there's a lot of ways that we are different. And so, aren't you glad for some spice in life? Wouldn't life be dull if both of you were identical? I mean, and, and just, you know, it would not be exciting. So, sometimes we have to appreciate the differences and, uh, and, and celebrate the similarities. Um, avoid taking what your spouse does for granted. So sometimes there's a delineation of duties. This is her job and this is his job. Uh, and, and so uh, sometimes uh, if he does his job, you expect him to do the lawn. You expect him to do uh, the outside type of stuff. But always 
recognize uh, you can either do it, well, it's about time you cut the lawn, or, honey, the lawn looks really nice. Uh, and and uh, but then there are those who we had a, some good friends of ours and we, they invited us over one day and uh, we went over Sunday afternoon and uh, she had just finished cutting the grass and and changing the oil in the car uh, and I thought huh and he had cooked dinner you know so I said their, their roles were I thought backwards uh, so appreciate you know that's often I'll tell Pastor B. I'm sure appreciate you washing my clothes because I dirty a lot of them and sometimes they're really dirty uh, and, and thank you for washing my clothes thank you for cooking this meal thank you for keeping our house clean just often just saying some kind words saying I appreciate you and sometimes it's just a little, the little non-verbal things of appreciation. I remember uh, for, a, for a season in our life, and I don't know how long ago this has been, uh, I would go to uh, uh, Winn-Dixie uh, when it was open. It's been closed for, I don't know, 10 years now for a long time. And there were always these little stuffed animals that were like two or three dollars. And so I'd just buy one and, and bring it home and, uh, and give it to her just as a, as a thank you un until we had no more place to put stuffed animals. Uh, so we, we didn't, I don't do that anymore. Uh, she showed me a poem that I wrote. Don't remember writing it. Uh, but just little things to let them know you appreciate what they do. The third thing is to be affectionate. Uh, John chapter 13 verse 34 love one another as I have loved you and, and I like Romans 12 uh, 9 and 10 it says let love be without hypocrisy be kindly affectionate to one another you see sometimes hypocrisy it, it simply means that your words and your actions don't line up you say one thing but you do another you do something else and so the word says that I should my words and my actions should line up do some something that shows your affection towards them um, last fall we uh, went through a Sunday evening several Sunday evenings where we did the five love languages uh, and those of you who participated in that recognize that your spouse speaks a different, perhaps speaks a different love language than you do. And it's important to find out what that love language is. Because when you find out what that love language is, then you can speak that language. You can show your affection to them by that language. Sometimes it's words of affirmation, just complimenting them, uh, acknowledging what they've done. And sometimes it's quality time. Uh, I know that in the evenings about 8.30 in the evening, Pastor B takes a deep breath and says, I'd like just a calming movie. And so we sit on our love seat and we hold hands. And some guys say, huh? And we just sit, you know, I, I want to sit in my recliner. So we sit on our love seat and we hold hands, except for when I'm rubbing her feet. Uh, and, and then before you know it, I hear because <laughs> she's out. And, and so I just keep rubbing her leg. And at the end of the movie, she said, oh, that was such a good movie. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope we'll make 51. <laughs> sometimes it's acts of service. Sometimes it's physical touch. Sometimes it's quality time. Sometimes it's just receiving gifts. You find out what your spouse's love language is and begin to speak that love language. Number four is you have to be a communicator, a conversationalist, someone who talks face to face, who talks adult to adult. 
I remember when, when, when I was uh, working in the oil field and our kids were little, I'd come in and Pastor B would say, talk to me uh, or watch the kids. I'm going to see that there's somebody in this world over two feet tall because she spent all of her time with the children. We have to be careful that we don't do an adult to child conversation, speaking down to them because they uh, perhaps aren't quick enough because they don't see it the way we see it. They're not, they, they can't see things the way we see things. And so it's important not to talk down to our spouse. In quality conversation, there's a couple of characteristics that you need to have. Watch your tone of voice. When you ask the question, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> realize that maybe there's a, a problem. Uh, using some eye contact, uh, visual eye contact, looking at one. I, 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 I usually have a little difficulty with that. You can ask Miss Trina, she'll come into the office and I'm working on something and she'll talk and, 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 and I won't look up. Well, she keep talking because I hear, and so sometimes Pastor B will come in and I will say something, and I'm busy doing something, and so I have to consciously make the effort to, to put my hands down, put the pens down, put whatever I'm doing down, and look at their face so that, I, that we have that eye-to-eye -eye contact. Now, you might want to avoid eye-to-eye -eye contact if you're driving. <clears throat> Because you, you want you, you know you want to keep your eyes on the road. When eye contact, be careful that you don't you know do the eye rolling thing. You, you, you know how that works? It's like you make a statement, you do oh yeah, uh huh, not again. What is her pro What is his problem? Uh, and, and and so we have to be careful. In conversation, sometimes, you know, I, I don't know, the, the psychologists say women are from Venus and men are from Mars, and, and we, we speak, we both speak English, but we don't have the same definition to the words that we speak, and so we have to get a clarification of what, what are those words that you just said to me mean. Uh, so sometimes we have to ask questions. Are, are you saying this? Uh, can I ask, what, what does that phrase mean to you? Uh, uh, and so when we do that, then we can clarify that we're on the same page. Uh, there are times when uh, Pastor B will ask me to do something, and I will do something, but it's not what she asked me to do. And, and so, but I thought you said, so we have to ask questions. Guys, most of us are Mr. Fix-Its. When the spouse, your wife, is saying something, telling you that she has a, a problem or a challenge, there are times when she's not asking for you to fix the problem. She's just wanting you to hear that she has a problem. Unless she said, do you have any advice? If she says those words, go ahead, fix it. But sometimes she doesn't want you to fix it at that moment. And so be aware of that. Sometimes you have to just listen. As a, as a, um, let's see, am, am I in the right place? Yeah. A good conversationalist will be one who listens intently without thinking about what you're going to say when they're finished. Because if you're thinking what they're going to say, what you're going to say when they're finished, you're not really listening to what they're saying. Because you're already preconceived what you're going to answer. And so you listen all the way to the end of their discourse 
and then you make some statements. Number five, it's important that you be a complement, not a competitor. A completer, not a competitor. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, Peter writes, As husband likewise de de dwell with your wives with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and, being, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. In Ephesians, it says the whole body is joined together. We each have a part to play. In a wedding and a marriage, it is the same way. That uh, our spouses have strengths and they have weaknesses. And if I, uh, if I take advantage of my spouse's weaknesses, I'm competing competing with her uh, and she's competing with me if she takes advantages advantage of my weakness and so we are to complement cover the weakness fulfill where they are help them in those areas of weaknesses help them fulfill their dreams their aspirations their desires be their biggest supporter be the one that is always in their corner not looking for a way to uh, downgrade or demean them, but rather to lift them up. Number six, be understanding. Live with understanding. Now, now, now please, Paul, uh, Peter is writing that men should live with understanding with their wife. I believe it's, it's a two-way street. It's both of us have to be understanding. Now, uh, to be fair... You'll never get to the place where you completely understand them. It not happen. However, you can live with them as though you are understanding. Where you make adjustments for each other. Understanding, uh, the, the proverb says, understanding is the wellspring of life to him who has it. In other words, if I begin to understand, uh, try to understand where she's coming from, what's going on in her life. Uh, the world says, walk a mile in somebody else's shoes before you criticize them. And so it's important. Now, I can't walk in her shoes. They're too small. Literally, but on the other hand, I can endeavor to try to feel what she's feeling in her life. Try to sense where she's coming from so that I can have some sympathy, some empathy, some compassion for her as well as for me. And so that compassion where we cut each other some slack. Amen. We cut each other some, some uh, 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 give them a little bit of leeway in things. It requires some patience. Because guess what? Change doesn't happen overnight. And so uh, I endeavor to change and I'm so grateful that Pastor B's patient with my change. And, and she's endeavoring to change. And we have changed a lot over the 50 years. And it's required us to be patient with each other. Number seven is to be forgiving. Uh, there are challenges that happen. There are misunderstandings that take place. There are things that we do that uh, uh, we, uh, after they're done, wish we hadn't done them. Uh, and uh, things we say, we wish we had not said. And so it's important to learn and, and, and forget about the movie. You remember the movie back, I think, when we were in college, there was a movie that went about, a, I think it was uh, Goodbye Columbus was, I believe, the movie. And, and the guy says, love means never having to say you're sorry. That is false advertisement. Uh, uh, love is meaning you have to say you're sorry. And, and, and uh, use those words along with, yes, I forgive you. And so those are important. 
Now there are some keys. This, this forgiveness is one of the major keys to marital growth. Uh, it's important when an issue has been discussed and has been dealt with never to bring it back up when another disagreement comes into play. Because if we keep bringing up the past, keep bringing up the old hurts, they are never resolved, the, the, the uh, tension never leaves. Sometimes there was a, a, a story of a, an older couple who had been married in their 50s or 60 years and someone asked them, uh, uh, the, the gentleman said, uh, you know, we've never had an argument in all of our years of marriage. And, and someone asked, how did y'all do that? He said, well, when she got upset, I took a lot of walks. So in other words, they never argued because he didn't stay around long enough for the argument to take place. He took a lot of walks. I'm not saying that you take a lot of walks, but I'm saying that you have to forgive and move forward. Realizing that when trust is betrayed, that is when the hurts are the deepest. And the only way that that can be resolved is if there is some forgiveness and not brought back up over and over again. But once the issue is resolved, trust is not automatic. Trust needs to be reestablished, needs to be uh, re-earned, if you would. Uh, to, to, to move another step further, we have to determine whether the issue, the event, was something that was premeditated, an intentional action, or just an honest mistake, or, or a, a, an error in judgment. And sometimes things are an error in judgment, then that doesn't necessarily, uh, it doesn't take as long to rebuild the trust when we find that out. But trust needs, still needs to be rebuilt and reestablished. But if it was something that was intentional, then it takes a little bit more time for trust to be rebuilt, but yet it still requires forgiveness. Number eight is to be faithful. The word says in Proverbs 27, a faithful man will abound with blessings. Faithful means to be loyal and steadfast. So we're loyal to God's word. We're faithful to his word, faithful to God. But when you, when you have a covenant with a wife uh, or a spouse, then you have made some promises. You've made some promises uh, and you uh, are to stick with those promises. Uh, most weddings have. Uh, you promise to be with them in good times or in bad, in sickness or in health, and in richer or for poorer. Uh, until death do you part. Uh, I remember reading a, a, an article uh, and they asked Ruth Graham, Billy Graham's wife, of, uh, before Billy passed away and asked her, he said, Billy is always traveling all over the world and is, is this major figure. Uh, have you ever thought about divorce? She said, divorce never, murder several times. <laughs> she said, then my promises would have been fulfilled and, and, and it says, until death do you part. Uh, and, and so, but she was faithful. And so it, it's important to know that faithfulness to your spouse is necessary. And the last one, again, there's several others that the Lord gave me this morning. It's just to be kind. It doesn't cost anything to be kind. Amen? And so we can either be rude, obnoxious, or we can be kind. Ephesians chapter 4, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted. 
1 Corinthians 13, it says, Love suffers long, or is patient, and is kind. Brother Larry, would you go get the children and have them come in, please? Uh, that's not part of the message. That's just what we're, we're doing. And so, we just shared some things with you that we've picked up along the way. Uh, and hopefully, this can help you, uh, not only in your uh, married relationship, perhaps in other relationships as well, but it can also help you keep the outlines because it can help you uh, helping other folks because sometimes uh, a message is, is for you, for you to implement some things, but sometimes it's for others. Uh, and so God places some things in your heart, in your life, so that you can be a, a blessing to other people. Amen? And so, um, if you don't have your communion elements, there are some on the back table. Uh, anyone not have theirs, we can get them now. Um, Mr. Marshall, would you keep your eye on how many that are there? If the children don't have any, there's a box underneath the tithes and offerings receptacle. If you would uh, kind of be ready in case uh, we need some more. <clears throat> Pastor B, would you come? And we're going to receive communion. I, I, we're going to wait till all of the children come in so that you can have communion with your family. Yes, ma'am. Praise your Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Children, don't forget, pick up your communion elements as you walk in. Maddie. There you go. I saw her just bouncing in. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We got a good crew back there this morning. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Why don't you just stand with me while we take communion. Get your family will come in and be close to you, be with you. Now keep in mind Living Glory Church has what we call it open communion. Which means you don't have to be a member of our church to receive communion with us. All we ask is that you be born again having made Jesus the Lord of your life. Anybody here this morning, you say, Pastor, I want to receive, receive communion with you, but I'm not, I have not made Jesus the Lord of my life. I'm just not sure if I'd go to heaven if I passed away today. Anybody like that here and you'd like to receive Jesus before we receive communion so you can receive it with us. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And so you take the little top cellophane off and expose the wafer. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul wrote and, and said that he got this directly from Jesus and the last, on that last supper and that supper, that communion. He took the bread, he broke it. And he, and he said that this is my body that was broken for you. And so as I, I, see, I see this, uh, anything that in your life is broken, perhaps it's a relationship, perhaps it's a, a health issue, perhaps it's something emotional. God said through this word, through this element, the dynamic working of the Holy Spirit will go in and make some restoration, heal, restore, deliver, and help. Amen? And so we take the bread and we say, Father, I thank you. By the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. I am made whole. Everything broken is made well. In Jesus' name, so I take the bread.
And he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this and as often as you do it in remembrance of me. And so we take the cup and Pastor B is with me this morning. One of the first things we did as a husband and wife was take communion. And, and so uh, we commit ourselves to each other on a regular basis. And as we do this this morning, we're receiving that as, as one of the first things. Of course, it was, our anniversary was on Friday. But that we recommit ourselves to each other, uh, to the Lord. And recognize that it is the covenant that is uh, established uh, with the blood of Jesus. Amen. And so uh, take the cup and recognize that the covenant has been established between you and the Lord. Perhaps if your wife or your, your spouse is with you, then just look at each other and, and, and make that same covenant, that same commitment again that you did however many years it might have been. Amen. I do commit and covenant to be your husband. I do commit and covenant to be your wife. Amen. Amen. And we take the cup. Thank you, Father. Now, do you have some instructions? So we do have two tables, round tables. One will be for Pastor B and I's family. I think Luke and Natalie will be joining us in a little bit, and Mom Lou. And there's another table for those who have uh, already celebrated their 50th anniversary. Brother Bob and Miss V uh, uh, will join us at that table. And Mr. Tim and Miss Carolyn will celebrate theirs in October. And so we wanted to acknowledge them uh, to be part. Uh, Miss B. Lachale and uh, Mr. Carroll wasn't able to be with us this morning, but she and, and Mr. Carroll celebrated their, is it 57? Yeah. 57. And so, uh, and Brother Bob, how many? 53. And Praise the Lord. Is there anybody else yes. in here that has been married 50 years or, or over that we... Mr. Lenny? Okay, yes. So you're yes. welcome to come... May 20th. Okay, well, you're okay. welcome to, we would like yes. you to sit at that special please, table Please as well. join us in, at that special table. Get to eat your cake with a, with a gold fork. Yeah. <laughs> so Pastor B has we instructions. I think some of the ladies have been uh, asked to, to help and some of the guys. And so I let her make those announcements. Uh, I'm going to, and if you need to leave, don't feel pressured that you have to stay. Uh, if you need to leave, please, you, you feel free. But we're going to invoke a blessing on you now. And so you can uh, go about your business. Father, we ask, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May his countenance always rise before you and make your way peaceful. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Pastor B. Now, we're going to take a few pictures behind this table right here. But I have two smaller cakes that they're going to, we're going to take just with one or two pictures. They're going to bring those cakes to the other table so that they can cut the cake and you can have your cake and punch while we take pictures. You won't just be sitting there. You can visit with with each other and uh, it's the same frosting the same filling <laughs> so uh, I didn't want you all to be just sitting and waiting and so the cake they will be cutting cake for you that you can get some from that table and some punch and again thank you so much for being here this morning and, and helping us celebrate this momentous occasion for us and with us amen miss Linda We just want to say happy 50th anniversary to Pastor Carl and Pastor Belinda. Give them a hand. <laughs> okay. We're taking this moment to acknowledge our pastors, Pastor Carl and Pastor Belinda. We're thankful for you 
and for your love for each other. We want to honor you today. Pastor Carl and Pastor Belinda, God has continually blessed you yes, yes. in his kindness during the past 50 years. We thank God for the grace and blessings that he has given this couple during the past 50 years of marriage. We celebrate with you and recall the day when they joined together as partners in life. We thank God for being with you on your daily journey together Amen. through life's ups and downs. Yep. We acknowledge that they have had to survive many heartaches, yet those two have always chosen to stay and get better and they weather out each storm as man and wife. Father, thank you for protecting their marriage. We all enjoy hearing about how Pastor Carl and Pastor Belinda started seeing each other. <laughs> Pastor Carl went to a Bible study that Pastor Belinda and her boyfriend <laughs> was attending. <laughs> Thank God Pastor Carl pressed in. <laughs> and he took care of that situation. <laughs> She was finally yours. <laughs> you both won. Yes. So glad that you were blessed with each other. Amen. Your uh, overseeing, <laughs> your marriage, overseeing it, it is so beautiful. And we love to see it. 50 years, y'all. Yeah. We want to thank you for all the service you do to Living Glory Church. And you still make the time for each other. Yeah. <laughs> Marriage is a covenantal union designed to strengthen the capability of each partner to carry out the plans God in their plan of God in their lives. I can say being in this, in this church 24 years your strength, you strengthen each other. When one goes through something, there's the other one coming in. <laughs> Whatever it is, they make each other strong and always carry out, always, the plan of God in their lives. Amen. And no matter what. Father, thank you for this marriage of 50 years help them to always remember when they first met and of course their beautiful children Jeremy Mandy and Luke what a beautiful example that y'all have had and their beautiful daughter-in-laws Sherry and Natalie their beautiful grandchildren Brandy and Amory, and most of all, Pastor Carl's mother. Yes, hey, Mom. Lucille, we call her Mom Lou. <laughs> we love to hear those stories of Mom Lou and Pastor Carl. Well, <clears throat> we also, um, we ask the Father to help them to remember the 50 years strong marriage in spite of building a church we thank God Lord. for the strong love that has grown between them we celebrate